This is Business Weekend. Hi and welcome to Business Weekend. I'm Edward Boyd. Coming up on the program, an insurance catastrophe has been declared in Victoria, Tasmania and New South Wales after damaging flooding and heavy rain since the 12th of October. Business reporter Ingrid Willens will take us through the major developments. We've got to make sure that uh, we don't fragment community, uh, communities by businesses having to close their doors and keep them closed. The federal budget will be handed down by Treasurer Jim Chalmers on Tuesday. We'll get a sense of what the small business sector is hoping to see with Alexi Boyd and the macroeconomic view with Danielle Wood from the Grattan Institute. We need to get productivity moving again. Uh, I'm not sure there's going to be um, too many major productivity announcements in this budget. And the ASX 200 might be up about 3% this month, but the threat of a global recession is still looming over our market. So have we hit the bottom yet? I'll speak with Matt Sherwood, the Head of Investment Strategy at Perpetual. That's all coming up on Business Weekend. But first, the Insurance Council of Australia on Wednesday declared an insurance catastrophe for regions of Victoria, Tasmania and New South Wales that have been affected by flooding since the 12th of October. The declaration allows claims to be fast-tracked by insurers. More than 6,300 insurance claims have already been lodged and plenty more are expected to come in over the next few days. Business reporter Ingrid Willinge wraps up this devastating event. In late February, the biggest flood on record hit the northern rivers in New South Wales and southeast Queensland. The effects, devastating. The most basic of needs, homes, electricity, water, roads, all inaccessible, destroyed. Now we are seeing history repeat itself in Victoria and heavy rain has continued over southern New South Wales and northern parts of Tasmania with more widespread flooding. The estimated damage bill, more than $5 billion and counting, according to the Insurance Council of Australia Chief Executive and Executive Director, Andrew Hall. Well, in terms of dollars, the dollars that we've uh, tracked since March and uh, the floods that occurred in southeast Queensland were sitting uh, $5.3 billion in claims. Uh, these last uh, set of events that have occurred across uh, Victoria, northern Tasmania and the like have generated around about uh, 7,500 claims. It's still early days though and we're getting uh, a couple more thousand claims a day come in uh, and I expect that that will add to the overall tally of La Nina for 2022. The rebuild effort is long and arduous. Biz Rebuild's patron, Sir Peter Cosgrove, observes just how relentless it's been for communities. Well, it's just, uh, uh, I, I think some fellow said deja vu all over again. It's. Uh, uh, when will the natural disasters cease to impact uh, these communities? Uh, and, you know, Lismore, uh, we still are rehabilitating there and they're getting more rain. Every time we get a shower of rain, um, people are suffering anxiety and, and, you know, I'm 51 years old and you're sort of expected to, to get on with things and move forward, but... Mm. It is a very real um, situation up here where people, and I'm not talking about a hundred people, there are thousands of people still living in houses that we would deem uninhabitable. So what's caused this record-breaking disaster? Experts say a highly unusual combination of weather events, two consecutive La Nina weather systems, which usually cause extreme rainfall, and now a third in sight. Insurers are on watch for even more potential flooding events. The uh, La Nina weather pattern has uh, obviously conspired to create some abnormality in terms of the actual claims outcomes, the flooding that we've seen over the last two or three years. So we put aside over $1.1 billion in terms of our allowances. And as you know, we've got a very strong reinsurance program sitting around it to provide the sort of protection that we need and that we need to then provide on, onwards to our customers. The impacts are far reaching. The agriculture sector often hit the hardest when it comes to natural disaster. It's an industry that's always had it tough. Weather, supply chain, COVID and staff shortages, now flooding. It's, it's a really hard situation. Um, you know, the farmers and the regional communities are really heavily impacted at the moment. It's not just um, floods that, uh, from, from the current time, it's also ongoing impact of COVID and cost of production um, that's really impacting farmers around the country. 
And it's not just this year's harvest that's impacted. It has ramifications for seasons to come, with delays to planting schedules. Well, on the East Coast, it has been substantial. And up to this point, the biggest problem areas have been around central New South Wales. So they had issues at planting. There was farmers replanting crops three times earlier this year. Then moving into the growing season itself, there were issues throughout that as well due to excessive rain. And then when you think, oh, it can't get any worse, then you have these significant issues coming right into harvest. So even before these rainfall events, on average in New South Wales, we were expecting only 85% of the crop areas that were planted to actually be harvested. And now that's likely going south towards, you know, maybe 80 per cent. It also impacts infrastructure like roads, water supply, other essentials, meaning it's impossible to get on with business. It's a waiting game. When you look at vegetable crops, they tend to operate on a sort of 12 to 16 week growing cycle. Um, so depending how far along the growing cycle um, the crop was uh, in the ground, um, yeah, they may be salvaged, which would be really good, and there might just be a little bit of a delay in getting yeah. that through the harvest. Uh, but if you need to you know, replant and, and go through that growth cycle again, you know, not only do you have the growth cycle of the plant, but you also need to wait for the ground to clear up so you can get tractors and machinery onto the ground to repair the paddocks. Seven months down the track in Lismore, rebuilding is still getting underway, with some industries faring better than others. Yeah, it's obviously not as fast as we'd like it to be. Uh, we're still waiting on some, some major announcements to come forward, uh, mainly in the residential space. You know, a lot of our businesses are, are pretty flood resilient and uh, our industrial estates are back up and running, not to full capacity, but it's going pretty well. A lot of our industries are, are getting back on track. Getting claims paid out is another obstacle. The process taking time as insurers are inundated with claim requests. But they are being processed. But we have seen rebuild times, for example, uh, that normally took around about 12 months. We're now seeing them extend out to 14 months. Um, and that's not in the interest of consumers. It's not in the interest of insurers. Uh, so we're doing everything we possibly can at the moment to increase the resourcing in that sector. The rebuilding process is long and there is a strong reliance on government to assist. In the current Victorian floods, we heard from Premier Dan Andrews on supporting what he calls the food bowl of the economy. Our agriculture sector is such an important part of our economic outlook, our prospects, so important to communities, flood affected and indeed well and truly beyond. This is the food bowl of our nation and we'll stand with every farmer, every primary producer, everybody in the agri agriculture supply chain uh, at this really difficult time. Small business has taken a sizeable hit. Enter Biz Rebuild, a charity run by the Business Council of Australia that works independently of the government to provide instant and immediate assistance to business in need. We're a fast-moving charity, but we aim ourselves at, at businesses. What we do as soon as we can, we make the assessments about who needs urgent help, and then we provide immediately uh, cash grants for various things, for the rehabilitation of businesses, a voucher of $2,000 or $500, depending on the sort of expenditure needed. We can walk up to somebody who is uh, in desperate uh, stakes, needing to get a cash injection to buy uh, essential office tools or to re-equip in some way, and we can give them a voucher for uh, a couple of thousand with just very... Uh, uh, scant checking. So long as they're in a disaster area, so long as they're needy, we can help. The sector is still doing it tough in the Northern Rivers region and it's a years-long process. Um, in, in this financial year till June 23, we're looking at losing $403 million out of our Lismore City economy. Uh, and when you consider that 85% of our businesses in Lismore are small businesses, that's a massive hit. The rebuild process, though, is helping to boost spirits on the ground, helping to get the business community back up and running. Businesses are the glue of the communities. So when an individual is down and out, uh, they need the familiar and necessary support of the local businesses who provide the stuff of life ordinarily. We've got to make sure that uh, we don't fragment community, uh, communities by businesses having to close their doors and keep them closed. That's the last card in the pack. So we know that if we can help businesses back onto their feet as quickly as possible, that only helps the wider community. You mentioned Lismore, and we were hopefully pretty quick, and we're still helping in Lismore. Uh, 
2.2 million dollars in those recent floods and here we are again with floods uh, but 2.2 million dollars uh, over 34 New South Wales local government areas and 14 in in Queensland so uh, we were pretty busy then and we're proposing to get busy again once a disaster has been notified that's a step that governments take and then we're in there. So with billions already spent this year on the flood recovery, can our insurers stomach a third potential disaster this upcoming wet season? Well, the insurance industry is um, well managed prudentially and, and this is what insurance is designed for when these events do happen. But they, it does have a, an effect, it does have an impact uh, on the system. Uh, out of the, I think, 60 odd billion dollars of premiums that are collected, over the last 12 months, insurers collectively across Australia made only about $900 million in profit. So when you compare that to other sectors, it shows that at the moment, uh, insurers are in a very high payout ratio because of all of these events. Um, and it's not just the big ones that are grabbing all the news headlines. The, this weather event has been persisting now for six months. This does have a cumulative impact on, on insurers. Uh, and it's one where they've got the, the reserves to deal with it, as well as reinsurance treaties and the like. This week, we've heard from Insurance Australia Group, which says due to the floods and the higher reinsurance costs, it will be increasing premiums across home, motor and commercial insurance classes. And it will not be the only one. Uh, very much the last two years and, th and the end of this year have been very much La Nina weather. Uh, we expect that to be an environment where we would exceed our allowances. Unfortunately, we've had three of them in a row and we'd hope that uh, coming, going forward that, uh, that we would get back to more normal conditions and that would see us sort of uh, actual outcomes sitting well within those allowances. Treasurer Jim Chalmers has spoken in detail about the economic storm clouds circling the world's biggest economies. Inflation, interest rates, falling house prices and skill shortages are just a few. So how will he manage these problems in Tuesday's federal budget? Well, joining me now is Danielle Wood, Chief Executive of the Grattan Institute. Danielle, thanks for your time today. What do you see as the biggest problems facing Australia's economy? Uh, so there are a number of fronts on which we face economic challenges. Clearly, we're not immune from the global slowdown, which is now really forecast to, to hit a lot of the world over the next year or so as central banks everywhere respond to the rising challenges of inflation. Uh, on top of that, we have a really tight labour market, which is um, causing challenges in, in some parts of the economy. And there remains um, all sorts of uh, supply side shocks uh, from the war in Ukraine and, and supply chain issues in China, which are continuing to, to bite in terms of prices. Are you expecting this budget to be filled mostly with election commitments? The Treasurer has said that this will be a bread and butter budget and I, th I think by that he really means that the focus will be on those election commitments. Uh, you know, we certainly heard talk that they might go further in some areas like the Stage 3 tax cuts, but I think that's now been wound back. So I expect largely it will be pretty straightforward uh, and the, certainly the key spending measures that we'll see will be the ones that they've already told us about. Yeah, we've had a few budget leaks already, including an increase in paid parental leave from 18 up to 26 weeks. How much do you expect this policy could cost and what are the big benefits from it? Uh, so the policy is going to be phased in over, over time. So uh, we won't actually see the full cost of the policy, I think, in the, the forward estimates because it doesn't, we don't get the full 26 weeks until 2026. Uh, my estimate is that once the policy is fully up and running, it uh, could cost about $600 million a year, uh, but it will be less than that in the short term because it's, it's ramping up over time. We've also heard, you talked about the tax cuts a second ago, we've heard the Stage 3 tax cuts, they're now forecast to cost about $254 billion over 10 years. That's up from about $240-odd billion. Is cutting taxes in the future something, the right thing we should be doing at a time when the Reserve Bank's trying to curb spending in the economy? It's really difficult to know whether they will be right for the economic environment because they don't kick in until 2024. Uh, so it's, it's always been, you know, a challenge to talk about whether the economic rationale for those tax cuts, because they are so far into the future. Uh, I certainly think we can say, though, that fiscally it's quite hard to justify a tax package of that size. 
Uh, remember, these stage, cap, these stage three tax cuts were, were sort of dreamed up back in 2018, before COVID, when we thought we were going to be seeing surpluses as far as the eye can see. Uh, we are obviously in a much more challenging fiscal environment now. And I think for that reason alone, uh, there, there is a case to, to revisit those, not necessarily to abolish them, but at least to find ways to reduce the impact on the budget. Is Australia's tax system too complicated right now? Does it need to be simplified? Uh, look, I think it is always a worthy goal to try and simplify the tax system. Uh, it is horrendously complicated, uh, frankly, uh, and I'm, I'm certainly not a tax lawyer, but uh, you know, I've seen the, uh, the Income Tax Act, which uh, spans many, many books. Uh, I would love to see a consideration of um, winding back tax concessions. Um, so there's a lot of leakages to the income tax base at the moment. Um, through things like super tax concessions, uh, negative gearing, the capital gains tax discount, family trusts. Um, there are a lot of ways that, that the well-advised can try and reduce their tax bill. Uh, I would rather see actually to you know, close down some of those loopholes and leakages, uh, and that would then allow us to, to bring down overall rates in a way that's more affordable for the budget. Yeah, boosting productivity in the economy is something we've previously spoken about. Are you hoping to see a lot of things to do with childcare benefits in this upcoming budget? Uh, so I think what we'll see in the budget around childcare benefits align with Labor's election commitments, which is to roll out higher subsidies to make childcare more affordable starting from mid next year. I think that's a really important measure for the economy. Uh, we know that our high out-of-pocket childcare costs are a big barrier for, for parents, particularly mothers with, with young children who would like to work more. Uh, making it more affordable will increase participation and will increase their um, capacity to work in the types of roles that they're, they're trained to do. So it is certainly, um, you know, I think a positive development for the economy as well. Previous budgets have been really big on infrastructure spending. We know the government's committing about $2.2 billion to Victoria's suburban rail loop. How much space do you think is, there is in this budget for other big infrastructure projects? So again, I suspect that it's going to be a focus on the ones that we've already heard about uh, coming into the election. Uh, the new government has said that it will focus on projects which have gone through an infrastructure Australia assessment uh, focusing again on kind of big national projects, uh, that would be you know, certainly an improvement and I think there is savings to be made in the budget by making better choices on infrastructure. Uh, of course, the commitment to the suburban rail loop isn't consistent with that. It's not yet gone through the Infrastructure Australia process. Uh, but I suspect given the sort of fiscal environment, uh, what we'll see budget night is, is largely the list of things that we uh, are already aware that Labor is committed to. And who do you think will benefit the most from this budget? Is it families, young families with kids? So I think uh, given we know that one of the biggest commitments in the budget from the election was the childcare package, which will uh, increase the, the subsidy for families that are using care. Uh, certainly it'll be families with, with young children that are big beneficiaries. Uh, many of them will be thousands of dollars a year better off uh, as a result of these changes. And on top of that, it will um, actually increase their capacity to, to work more and participate in, more in the workforce if that's what they would like to do. And then once this budget's complete, we'll be back again in April for the next one. So is this current budget coming up entirely necessary? Uh, I think the reason for this budget was just to actually legislate some of those election commitments and, and get them in train. Uh, it is true that two budgets a year is uh, unusual and, and a, a lot, um, but I think you know, they really wanted to, to make sure that that agenda was happening uh, and we can all look forward to doing it again next May. And just quickly, productivity, how important is it to improve that in our economy? Uh, look, productivity is absolutely crucial when we talk about long run growth in living standards, the thing that's going to boost incomes of all of us across the economy. Uh, we need to get productivity moving again. Uh, I'm not sure there's going to be um, too many major productivity announcements in this budget. We know childcare is really an important one, uh, but I would certainly hope to hear more um, from the government on that, um, particularly leading into next May's budget. Well, Danielle Wood, Chief Executive of the Grattan Institute, thanks for your time today. Thanks for having me, Ed.
Well, we've just heard the macroeconomic view. Let's now get a sense of how the small business sector is feeling and what policies it's hoping to see at the budget. Well, joining me now is Alexi Boyd, the chief executive of COSBOA. Alexi, thanks for your time today. Let's start with cybersecurity. We've seen some major companies attacked recently like Optus and now Medibank. What's your reaction to the Medibank attack and how threatened are small businesses to ransom attacks like this? Well, what this shows us is that every company is vulnerable and all companies need to improve their cyber security initiatives in order to make sure that they're not um, the victim of an attack. And certainly small businesses need to work on their cyber security uh, initiatives to make sure that they're protected against this sort of thing. All uh, corporations, all small businesses are vulnerable to attack. Our survey has found that um, almost half of attacks more recently have been uh, uh, targeted at small businesses. So this Cyber Wardens initiative is about empowering them to improve the cybersecurity awareness and uh, mitigating risks within their business so that they can pre protect themselves, their customers' data and the future of their business. What support are you getting with your Cyber Wardens program from Telstra and the Commonwealth Bank? Well, we're pleased to be partnering with uh, Commonwealth Bank and Telstra for this particular initiative. We're also working with the Australian Cyber Security Centre who are providing us with support and all the information. Uh, the Commonwealth Bank and Telstra obviously have large small business customer bases and we're hoping to roll out this program and, and target as many small businesses as possible to improve their cyber security and mitigate those risks. The concept is that a small business person chooses an employee or perhaps themselves or their trusted advisor to take on the, uh, the understanding of what they need to do as a small business owner to mitigate the risk for cyber security. And then that person is actually empowered through micro-credentials and a recognised micro-credential so that they, when they move on to the next position or the next small business, they take that information with them. So the Cyber Wardens Initiative is about empowering more small business employees to really have a good understanding of what's required, but also to teach others within the small business and within the community as well. Do you think these attacks on Medibank and Optus have been a bit of a wake-up call for a lot of business owners out there to these cyber risks? Absolutely. Small businesses are, are, are very cognizant of the risk of, of cyber attacks. The problem is they're not entirely sure how to mitigate the risk within their business. And this program is designed by small businesses for small business. And the concept is to look at what are relatively non-technical um, options to make sure that they empower themselves and their employees to do the right thing. 19 out of 20 attacks are actually caused by human error and meaning that the small business owner can have up to, you know, $50,000 in costs, not to mention that the time that it takes to rebuild after a cyber attack and the reputational damage. We're seeing it happen at the corporate level and small businesses will work harder to mitigate their risk as well. Let's talk federal budget. Obviously, there's a lot of skill shortages with small businesses complaining about a lack of employees. What can the government do in this budget to encourage more people to enter the workforce to help those businesses? Well, we know from small businesses and from our members that the number one, two and three issue right now is skill shortages and worker shortages. What we'd like to see the government do is put small businesses first when they're thinking about the strategic planning and the workforce planning into the future. So we've got options such as a small, a small business commissioner specifically in the Jobs and Skills Australia uh, section, for instance. That's a way of putting small businesses first, understanding that the needs of small businesses are very different to those of big business, particularly when it comes to skills. And the forward planning for workforce strategies, it's very important that we think of small businesses and what their needs are. And to include small business associations in that strategic planning is so important because they really know what the future of their workforce needs are. You're also calling for an extension to the budget program, which helps give young women confidence to become entrepreneurs. Is this program simply going to come to an end if it's not funded again this year? Well, we'll continue to seek funding from multiple sources, but absolutely, this has been a critical program um, to encourage uh, young women and young girls to think about what the future of entrepreneurialism looks like for them. It, uh, it helps them to start a business. It helps them to understand um, how you can uh, take something from a concept to a minimum viable product and beyond. And we're really thrilled that it's something that's recognised within the school curriculum nationally. So importantly, it's something that teachers can pick up and use in the classroom, and it's actually compliant with the school curriculum. So we think it's a really important program, particularly looking at the future of women in the workforce, women in small business, and this is the next generation of women, found, women female founders, and we'd like to see that continue. And can you just explain to us what least cost routing is and why should it be introduced for retailers or other businesses out there with FPOS terminals? 
So an increasing cost for small businesses is the cost for their debit card transaction fees. And least cost routing is about making sure that um, the cost of that transaction always goes through the least cost, which in Australia is generally the FPOS route. But it's about making sure that that's the default. So small businesses don't have to work their way through all of the different options to find out what the best option is for them. It should be a default that they're paying the least amount for those debit card transactions. And those are increasing as we use our mobile wallets more and as we use, uh, you know, tap and go or we're using it in, in online payments, increasingly people are turning to debit card transactions and those fees are quite high. So what we'd like to see is that the default is the least cost and then if the banks or the payment institutions want to offer a better product or perhaps a faster gateway or perhaps better cyber security on their payments then they upsell to the business but the basic cost should be the least cost for small businesses it's costing a tens of millions of dollars a month for small businesses and it's something that the government can do to save small businesses money particularly in the retail sector and how do you rate your chances of getting some of these policies or all of these policies funded and approved by the government at this budget? Well, the government said that they were turning their attention to small businesses in a number of ways, and this is a really good opportunity for them to show that they want to support small businesses as female founders. They'd like to see a lower cost for small businesses with things like least cost routing, and the opportunity is there for the future planning for small businesses with things like the instant ad asset write-off. We've got a number of measures in our pre-budget submission that we'd like to see the government adopt as soon as possible to alleviate the pressures on small businesses in whatever way that they can. So are you feeling pretty hopeful about budget on Tuesday? We're hopeful that the government is going to prioritise small businesses as the, the, you know, the engine room of the economy and the importance placed on small businesses within the community. It's very important that we look after small businesses so that they can continue to employ, so they can continue to be um, a fundamental part of the community by supporting others. You only have to look around the country and see what's happening with the floods to see how the community supports small business and how small business steps up to support its local community. And so we'd like to see structural reforms to make it easier to run a small business, but also put small businesses first to make sure that we, we retain those small businesses and look after their resilience way into the future. Well, Lexi Boyd, Chief Executive of Cosboa, thanks for your time today. Thank you. Coming up after the break, Perpetual's Matt Sherwood is in the studio to discuss the potential of a future recession. Plus, the future of carbon capture and storage, or CCS. Ross Greenwood speaks with the Global CCS Institute next. Welcome back. The ASX 200 plunged 7.3% in September. One of its worst months on record. So far it's up about 3% in October, but the market is still pretty close to its lowest level since the end of 2020. So where does it go from here? Well, joining me now on the set is Perpetual's Head of Investment Strategy, Matt Sherwood, who recently won Zenith Investment Partners' Best Real Return Fund at the Zenith Awards. Uh, Matt, congratulations for that, but... Have markets really hit the bottom yet or is there still a way to go? Well, thanks for having me on the show, Ed, and it's a team award, so I didn't win it. It was the multi-asset <laughs> team. But, you know, my suspicion is the market's got more to fall um, and it's certainly not the time for investors to go bottom fishing at the moment. And what we've had so far this year is global equities are off 25%. Australian equities are down by around 11 You know, but it's all been valuation contraction. Central banks have jacked up rates. Real bond yields have risen, that's weighed on PE ratios. But what the market hasn't factored in yet is the earnings destruction, uh, which is likely to occur in 2023. And that to me is going to be another headwind for the market. Um, so, you know, we're not getting tempted at these uh, levels just yet. Are we talking first quarter next year or a bit later on in the year? Well, our suspicion is the global recession occurs in the second half of next year. It's going to be driven by the US economy. Um, and, uh, you know, most of the regions will, uh, will follow them down. Uh, Australia's soft landing prospects, um, you know, are reasonable at this stage. Uh, the currency is doing the usual job at shock absorbing. And the echoes out of the RBA is that, um, you know, they probably only want to hike rates three more times and then they will go on pause and have a look to see how the economy adjusts. So they seem to be leaning a bit more towards financial stability than just solely jacking rates up until you get a labour market correction like the Fed's doing. So that improves our outlook. 
Yeah, Treasurer Jim Chalmers says our economy seems to be in better shape than others around the world. But what are some of the really big risks out there that are making investors nervous and sell off their shares? Yeah, well, clearly the big risk at the moment is just the inflation backdrop and what that is forcing central banks to do. So what we've seen in the Fed um, is that in the last couple of months, they have put an increase in US unemployment right at the centre of their reaction function. So they're just going to continue to move rates up. And obviously that's the clear economic risk is higher rates cause recession. But probably a tail risk, I think, is uh, the Fed is uh, not only increasing rates aggressively each meeting, but they're doing it just meeting after meeting. So this is the most aggressive tightening cycle pretty much since Volcker in, in the early 1980s. That could, um, if those tentacles go far enough, start to uh, spark some financial dislocation and the sort of stresses uh, that we, um, you know, that we've seen in other uh, periods of financial crisis. So, you know, it's just a tail risk at this stage. It's not a central case. Uh, but if inflation proves more resilient, the Fed's probably going to tighten more. Um, and, of course, the more they tighten, the more those risks in the dark areas of the financial system and the financial markets can actually be uh, triggered and uh, in, into a liquidity crisis. And where that goes from there, of course, depends on where the central bank goes. But that's just a risk case at this stage. And how confident are you feeling as an investment strategist right now? Oh, well, I tend to think that uh, we, we remain pretty cautious, uh, and I do too. Um, you know, recession next year not being priced as market is not really a reason to just dive in head first. Um, even when we started this year, we came in there thinking, you know, US bond yields were one handle in front of it when we got 40-year highs in inflation and 50-year lows or close to it in unemployment you know, really didn't kind of sit well with us. So we were very defensively positioned um, in our real return fund. We had no duration exposure and we knew that if bond yields rose, that would be a pretty serious headwind also for equities. And we had a very low equity exposure and we augmented that with a lot of put option protection. Now, you know, we still remain pretty guarded and cautious. Um, you know, I think there are risks out there. This turns into a much bigger sell-off and it really depends on what central banks do um, and how markets react to that. So there's certainly that possibility. So we're not dipping our toe in the water at, at the moment. Cash rates are 2.6% in Australia right now. What's the money market pricing it in? Where's it going to get up to? Yeah, this is an interesting one because the money markets have the RBA doing another 150 points within the next year, you know, just up to over 4%. Now, the worry I would have with an interest rate that high is that it, it takes, um, uh, you know, it, it might actually just crack the housing market here. And the reason why that's a worry um, uh, is particularly the bank's exposure to that housing market. Now, house prices have risen about 50% since the trough they had uh, late last decade. You know, so prices coming off 10% after 50%, it, it, you know, is not really a big deal. Uh, but the real big key here um, is that if there's much more strain on the housing market and you get for selling, uh, all of a sudden you can have a much bigger price uh, collapse and, uh, you know, and that could trigger some stresses in, in the economy and also um, in the financial system. So again, not a base case, uh, but it's certainly a risk that is out there. Looking and at America, according to BlackRock, um, it's just been the worst year of performance for stocks and bonds since 1969, apparently. I mean, what are the chances for the US economy being in a recession as we speak? Uh, well, at the moment, I think they're pretty, you know, extremely low. Um, uh, there's still quite a bit of strength in the private economy, so consumption um, still remains fairly solid. Uh, and the labour market at this stage remains intact. Uh, but that said, we tend to think that a recession probability next year is around 70%. Uh, so it's very, very elevated. Normally, you might have a 10% probability for any random year. So, you know, very elevated. That They've never had such high inflation without it leading to a recession. Um, and, of course, the Fed is uh, hiking rates very, very aggressively. And in some ways, I almost think they're embracing their inner Volcker um, and engineering a recession because they probably know it's the only way to get inflation back to 2%, given the backdrop we have of you know, up to uh, 8 to 9% inflation with an unemployment rate at a 50-year low. Well, Matt Sherwood, Head of Investment Strategy at Perpetual, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for having me, Ed, and all the best.
The holy grail of carbon reduction has long been to capture carbon dioxide and store it underground. But some projects, notably at Chevron's giant's Gorgon gas project in Western Australia, have failed to meet their targets. Ross Greenwood caught up with Alex Zapantis, the chief executive of the carbon capture think tank, the Global CCS Institute, and asked him about its future, given there are other ways for companies to mitigate their emissions. So every analysis that's been done, really going back to Pakala, Pakala and, and Sokolow's uh, famous Wedges paper, which is almost 20 years ago, finds that you need a very broad portfolio of approaches to uh, chart the least cost, least risk uh, pathway down towards zero emissions or net zero emissions. CCS is just one of those technologies which is absolutely critical, particularly in industries where in some cases there are no other options because the industry produces inherent uh, emissions of carbon dioxide that are a function of the chemistry of the process, not the energy source. OK, so your membership includes, say, the British government, the Victorian government, uh, it includes the Scottish government, all, you know, there is uh, carbon emissions from each of those as a result of uh, the extraction of hydrocarbons. But the one point about this is, does this require more government money, more assistance to encourage you know, those organisations that are emitting to really try and, you know, enc encourage this carbon capture and storage? So what's required is policy that makes a business case for investment in CCS. And there yeah. are some really good examples of this around the world. So, for example, in the US, there are very significant tax credits which are now available, offering up to $85 per tonne of carbon dioxide stored uh, for CCS. In Europe, of course, you have a good carbon price, which is greatly valuable in terms of uh, incentivising CCS. But there is also support from the EU Innovation Fund, which is billions of euros overall, um, which is supporting investment in CCS. So CCS is a bit like renewables were, say, 20 years ago. It's, it's an emerging nascent industry. It needs government policy to really make that business case for investment in CCS. There are many ways of doing that. Some of that might be provision of funds. Other might be through regulation, uh, through, through assistance, through the provision of uh, essential infrastructure, for example. So there are many ways of doing it, but it does need some sort of policy driver, as do pretty much all uh, climate mitigation investments, which are purely for climate mitigation purposes. OK, but here in the 2017 budget, the Turnbull government at that time announced the cessation of the Low Emissions Technology Demonstration Fund. Mm. And then, of course, there was a carbon capture and storage flagships program in the financial year 2019 wiped out. So effectively, the federal government here has walked away from the funding and the encouragement of carbon capture and storage projects. Is that the way you see it? Those are historical programs that were focused on demonstration projects. So mm -hmm. they, it wasn't, they, they actually weren't about com commercial deployment. They were about demonstration, small-scale pilot projects. OK, so is there enough incentive for the commercial, apart from such as Gorgon being forced by the WA government to actually implement it as part of the development uh, approval process for that uh, gas development project? We believe there needs to be more. We believe the commercial incentives for investment in CCS in Australia are insufficient for Australia to chart its course to net zero emissions according to the least cost, least least uh, risk uh, route. So there is there are some incentives available here now. For example, you can create Australian carbon credit units uh, through, the, through the undertaking of CCS project and they're trading at about $30 or thereabouts a tonne. So that's a significant incentive. In fact, it's assisted with Santos's Moomba project to get that over the line to FID. But clearly, if our ambition is to get to net zero, the, this country needs to do a lot more across all sectors using all technologies, CCS just being one of them, and there will need to be additional policy uh, measures put in place to really drive the billions of dollars of private capital investment into this space that's necessary to establish these projects. OK, we'll go to a couple of the projects here. Gorgon is one I've mentioned. In the case of Gorgon, they're right now buying carbon credits and looking for other offset programs mm. because they have not been able to achieve the targets that have been set down by the WA government in the production of the gas uh, through Chevron, the, the owner and operator, um, at that Gorgon gas field. Is that showing a lack of veracity of the cases that have been put in place for carbon capture and storage? Not at all. So Gorgon is one project. And if you look at any industry, you'll find examples where, for all sorts of reasons, particular projects have particular difficulties. Gorgon is having a very particular difficulty uh, with, with the injection wells, sorry, with the water production wells. It's not the case... Uh, that's not representative of, what, of the experience across broader 
uh, all of the other 30 operating CCS projects that are operating ar around the world. So, you know, Gorgon is often held up as, as some sort of demonstration of the failure of CCS. Mm. The fact is, Gorgon to date has stored well over 6 million tonnes of CO2, which would otherwise have gone into the atmosphere. They've stored three or four times more CO2 in the same period than the largest project uh, funded under the Emissions Reduction Fund. OK, so let's go to another one then. The Shoot Creek uh, ExxonMobil project in the United States is the biggest in the world. That's the one that people hold up there as being, by far and away, much bigger than Gorgon, which I think is the fourth largest in the world right now. Mm -hmm. So in that case, 50% of the, uh, the, the carbon has been vented, 50% has been stored. What are the targets long term? Because obviously 50% being vented into the atmosphere is still not considered to be a good outcome where does it need to be in the future? So what you need to consider about Shoot Creek is how old is that project? It's decades old. Yeah. Um, it was established many, many years ago for enhanced oil recovery and how much carbon you capture in any CCS project is, is a commercial decision. So today the incentives for high levels of capture are very much stronger than they were 20, 30, 50 years ago. 50 years ago when the first CCS projects actually started operation in the United States. If you look at the current fleet of CCS projects which are in development, they're all targeting 95% or thereabouts captured because that's what's required. And so here in Australia, the one that people hold up is really the Moomba gas fields, right? And this is the Santos project, the Cooper Basin, where the gas is extracted and therefore the common sense is the infrastructure is there to be able to process carbon dioxide and pour it back into the reservoirs from which the gas has already been extracted. That almost seems to be the holy grail of projects. That is certainly the lowest cost opportunity and, and there will be many of those around the world where you already have the infrastructure, you already have really good knowledge of the subsurface, so you're not needing to spend a lot of resource on identifying your storage resource and you have the right industry with the right expertise for which that particular practice is, quite frankly, their day job. Um, but there will be other projects which are not so easy as that, which will require stronger policy support really to bring that private capital in. OK, and then the final part about this is your organisation, as I say, a think tank, mm. it argues that companies and nations around the world will not be able to achieve their net, ze net zero emissions targets unless carbon capture and storage not only is technically sound but also has sufficient capital invested in it to create these projects around the world. That's exactly right. And it's not just us that's saying that. That's on the back of analysis by the IPCC, by the International Energy Agency, by any number of academics uh, and other think tanks that have looked at how do you actually achieve net zero emissions. There are certain industries which produce CO2 emissions for which there is no other option other than to capture those CO th that carbon dioxide and then geologically store it. CCS is the answer to that. Now, in order to make that work, the technology is there. I mean, the technology, some of this technology is almost 100 years old. Um, it's being improved and enhanced, of course, in recent times, but it's, not, it's far from new but you need the commercial business case to drive the private capital into this sector to build the projects. If it's not profitable or it doesn't create value for business, business won't invest in it. And the broader social need that we have, which is around a stable climate and lower carbon dioxide emissions, won't be met. So absolutely, CCS is absolutely critical to getting to net zero, uh, as is everything else, by the way. CCS is not some sort of silver bullet here. You need absolutely everything. And if anything is off the table, the cost and risk goes up. That is a consistent finding of pretty much every rigorous analysis that's ever been done since climate became an issue. Alex Zapance is from the Global CCS Institute. Many thanks for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you. After the break, we take you to the United States to get a sense of how the midterm elections are tracking. We'll catch up with the Australian's Washington correspondent, Adam Crichton, who's in Phoenix, Arizona, where the state governor is up for election. Welcome back. Jim Chalmers is putting his final touches on next week's federal budget, which is expected to be filled with election promises. The Treasurer was in the United States last week meeting his counterparts from a range of countries, along with the head of the US Federal Reserve, the IMF and the World Bank. Let's bring in Adam Crichton, Washington correspondent for the Australian newspaper. Adam, thanks for your time. You caught up with Chalmers mm -hmm. when he was in Washington last week. He's been talking up doom and gloom a lot recently. What vibe did you get from him when you spoke to him? 
Well, I think it's fair to say he was talking up doom and gloom here as well, and I think that's fair enough. It's very worrying times, I think, to be treasurer of a major country or indeed any country now. He met with a range of finance ministers from other G20 countries, as you say. He, he also met the chairman of the Federal Reserve to hear about the likely path of interest rates in the US, which, of course, uh, has massive effect on the Australian dollar, which has been falling, as you know. I think it's about 62, 63 cents. I remember when I arrived here last year, it was 77. So that is an extraordinary decline with, of course, massive implications for Australian imports and exports and also future inflation and future interest rates in Australia. And I'm sure uh, Jerome Powell told him that, that the likely direction of rates is up and considerably up. I mean, after we saw those inflation figures in the US last week, which I think uh, came out on the day that Chalmers met the chairman, uh, they were very worrying. You know, they showed the core inflation, which is what all the economists look at, was up 6.6%, I believe, over the year. And the overall rate of inflation has been above 8% for seven months in a row. Seven months. That is that is quite extraordinary. And that means central banks, both here in Australia, in the UK, are going to have to jack up rates much, much more. Yeah, I heard a rumour that Chalmers may have walked out of that meeting with Jerome Powell ashen-faced. Do you think the chair of the Federal Reserve might have basically told him they're willing to do whatever it takes to push down inflation, even if that means tipping the US economy into recession? Well, look, I think they have to. I mean, I think one of the... I mean, I think Australia and the US have, you know, fairly similar economic dynamics at the moment. I mean, Australia is maybe a few months behind, but, you know, the inflation rate, of course, is increasing. We saw recently in New Zealand massive, a massive increase there on the upside. Probably the same thing's going to happen in, in Australia next week when we get the third quarter. Uh, the interesting difference, I think, about the two countries is a wages are not growing as fast in Australia, which is, which is, I guess, bad in a sense, because it means real wages are falling even faster in Australia, which, of course, is a huge political concern uh, for the government. But, yes, uh, certainly the Fed has to keep its credibility. It, it, you know, one interesting thing is that inflation expectations, and this is about the only silver lining there is if you talk to US economists, is still about 2.5%, 3% in five years' time. So people seem to think when you ask them in surveys, and also on financial markets, they think that inflation will fall back to two or three percent, um, and that's and that's quite an impressive achievement. And of course, central bankers like to put that down to their credibility, and they say if they lose their credibility, then suddenly those expectations could increase very rapidly. And once that happens, it's the 1970s all over again. And at the same time, it seems like President Joe Biden is claiming the U.S. economy won't fall into a recession. So how's that being received over there in the states? Well, certainly Chalmers did not receive it very well because one of the first things he said in his press conference was that he disagreed with the president. So I thought that was quite amusing. And I mean, to be fair, I think Jim Chalmers is right. I think the risk of a recession here in the US next year is very high. The reality is, as we just discussed, interest rates are going to keep on climbing. At some point, that is going to hit the housing market here, housing construction, uh, car purchases, to, an, to a point where there is a significant slowdown. Now, so far, that has not happened, which has been somewhat puzzling. You've still got a jobless rate here of, I think, 3.7, uh, 3.5. Don't quote me on that, but it's very, very low. Uh, that uh, hasn't increased yet. But again, if you look at history, if you look at the past 40 years of recessions in the US, the unemployment rate will increase very suddenly and very rapidly. And that's what we could be looking at early next year. You're currently in Arizona for the midterm elections where all the seats in the US House of Representatives are up for election, along with some state governor positions too. What's the atmosphere like in Phoenix at the moment? Well, look, I think there's a real push towards uh, the Republicans here. I went to a rally last night for Carrie Lake to see what was going on there, and she is the Republican candidate for governor. Uh, she started well behind a couple of months ago in the polls and the betting markets, and now she's well ahead and looks like winning. And I think that's a trend that is reflected across the country. I mean, I just checked this morning. If you look at the betting markets for the US Senate, which is probably what everyone's looking at, it's 50-50 at the moment. Obviously, uh, Democrats want to maintain uh, their control of it with the vice president's casting vote, but it's looking more and more likely that the Republicans will retake it. Uh, they had a 35% chance of taking it about four weeks ago and now it's 65%, uh, which is an enormous turnaround. And uh, political analysts aren't quite sure why. Nothing seems to have really happened. Uh, the, you know, the best candidates are that those last week's inflation figures really worried Americans. Uh, but uh, whatever the case, it's certainly looking up for Republicans and, and certainly here in Arizona too, I would say.
That's all for the show this Sunday. Up next is all the latest news right here on Sky News. Business Weekend returns next Sunday, but don't forget you can keep up with all the latest business news with our daily program, Business Now, at 4.30 and 11.30pm Eastern Daylight Time. Thanks for your company. I'm Edward Boyd. We'll see you next week.